All righty, college, good morning. It is 11.10 and we are going to begin our worship service very soon. So I just want to encourage you, if you're, in, uh, if you're joining us in person, please let's make our way to the aisle. And if you're joining us online, just want to welcome you. I'm so glad that you could join us today via live stream. I, um, and yes. Right. So as we make our way to the aisle, uh, let's just greet the person on the left and on our right and just welcome them, say hello to them, take a moment to do that. And, and as we do, let's all rise. So the call to worship for today comes from Exodus chapter 15, verse 13. This is the time when the Israelites were just delivered from Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea and Miriam and Moses lead God's people into song. And this is what they say. In his steadfast love, the Lord has led his redeemed people and guided them to his holy abode. In steadfast love, the Lord has led his people and guided them to his holy abode, to his holy sanctuary. And in light of the redemption that God has accomplished in our lives as he saved us from our sins, cleansed us of every unrighteousness, and given us the righteousness of Jesus Christ, let's come together into his presence and worship him in his presence. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that on this Lord's Day, you have gathered us here together. We are coming from different places, some with very busy weeks, some with great burdens that we are carrying on our hearts and our shoulders. But Lord, as you've called us to come here, may we cast our anxieties and burdens on you and lift up our gaze to gaze upon you, the living God, who is our heavenly Father, who cares for us and who wants to fill us with the knowledge of God today for our enjoyment, rest, and satisfaction. So God, will you come and perform this ministry in each one of our lives? We thank you. We look forward to this. In Jesus' name we pray. Close like no other. I know you as a father. I know you as a father. I know you as a friend. And I have faith in the good.
so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more the cost we stood neath the dead we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more listen that again what riches of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost he stood neath the dead
King forever and we thank you for the cross there in the ground sealed in the dark the frame of the Father, Son, in agony. He watched His only Son be sacrificed. He gave it all for me. Hallelujah, what a Savior. King forever, and we thank you for the cross. But on that day, which seemed as the darkest star of my little broke through and shook the ground. Thank you for the cross, hallelujah. 
wanted us so much to be where he is, more than we want to be where God is. God wanted us to enjoy eternal life and joy in heaven with him. And he came to us. He came, he came down to this earth. And Father, I pray that if there is any of one of us here who haven't experienced the goodness of this kind of love, of the love of the Father who sent his only son to rescue sinful people like us. I pray right now, Lord, that you would reveal your love. You would reveal your loving kindness, your heart, God, for the lost, for the broken. Can we just take a minute? Can we take a minute to reflect on this, to pray, to thank God? for the way that he has rescued us, for the way that he has entered into our world, not asking us to meet him where he is, but coming down to us. Just take a minute to respond to that. Psalm 40, the psalmist writes, Do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and your truth always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased, O Lord, to save me. O Lord, come quickly to help me. I want to invite us uh, to have a time to confess our sins before God. And our confession of sin is actually our call for God to rescue us. It's our confession that we need God to save us because we can't save ourselves. We can't take care of the problem of our sin. You know, sin isn't just doing something wrong. It's not just doing, not doing something right. Sin is an attitude, unseen attitudes of our heart that we live with. It's a nature that we carry. We carry a sinful nature. This isn't something that we can solve on our own. So as we confess, can we, let's confess with gratitude, knowing God is hearing this as our call. Lord, I can't do it. So Lord, would you come? Would you save me? Would you cleanse me once again from my sin? Let's just do this together and then I'll close us.
is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. As pervasive as sin might be, it doesn't have the final word. Jesus Christ, the Alpha and Omega, salvation and rescue is our final word. So Father, we come before you with this salvation upon us, freely given from your hand, knowing that when we confess, when we see the sin within us, and when we repent of it, when we confess it, God, you hear that cry, that cry of dependence, of humility, of seeking after you, and you respond every single time, Lord. You don't leave us alone to deal with our mess, to deal with our sin. But God, you love to save and respond to your people. We thank you, Lord, that this is who you are. I pray that this gospel truth would burn in our hearts. God, not just here, but Lord, as we live our day-to-day lives, God, would we walk with this gospel speaking to us, forming our thoughts, forming our hearts to become more like Christ. We thank you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys may take your seats. Uh, we're going to have a, our time of offering, but if you guys saw in your chairs, there's an envelope there. And like we mentioned last week, we're going to have a special offering today for uh, the Turkey and Syria uh, relief offering. And so... I don't know if you guys saw the latest news, but they're about to wind down the rescue effort. And they've confirmed almost 46,000 dead. Um, just, you can't, I can't even imagine the devastation, the heartbreak that is happening in those nations. So, you know, if you feel compelled to give, just want to encourage you to give. You can give it in the offering envelope. Uh, if you've been giving online, there's actually a designated fund you can select as well. So just look through look through the options, it'll pick designated offering and then you could select Turkey and Syria offering if you give online. So we'll go ahead and give our tithes and offerings and then I'll close us in prayer. pray together. Father, as we give our offerings this morning, just want to lift up particularly Turkey and Syria and all the people who have been affected directly, indirectly, who have family and friends who have been killed, who have been harmed in this earthquake. Lord, we, we don't know, God, why, but we do know your character. Lord, you're a good God. You're a God of love. Lord, you see every single hurting soul. So we pray right now that you would come and whatever work you're doing, I pray, Father, that you would bring your comfort, you'd bring your peace, and that you would bring your gospel. Lord, that this would even be an opportunity for those who don't know you yet to seek you, to find you, God, and that you would save them as well. So, Lord, we We just ask that you would bless the offering that we give, that our church gives, that it would be used to help many people. God, that it would be used to help further your gospel, Lord, and the work of your kingdom as you are at work globally, and not just here in our homes and in our city. We thank you, God, that you are in control, even in the darkest of times. We trust you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All right, good morning, E-College. What's good, y'all? My name is David. I am a staff member here at E-College. And I just want to say 
Uh, thank you for joining us this morning and welcome, um, especially if you're new here. I just want to say um, hello to you guys um, particularly. And um, if you're free after service, just feel free to stop by real quick to myself or any of the pastors or any of the staff members just to say hi. And um, we just like to introduce you to some of the people in our ministry too, like even some of the students. So uh, please don't be shy. And before announcements, um, let's just take a minute to say hi to the people next to us and ask them, what is your comfort food? All right. Okay, well, my favorite comfort food is a burger, and we will actually be eating in and out for lunch today as a ministry. Ooh, oh, yeah, okay. So um, please um, come through. It will be the in and out at Firestone Boulevard in La Mirada, the one by Candemir Viola. Um, and next week, we will be having lunches with um, our classes. And it'll be combined. I said that kind of choppy, but it'll make sense next week. So please be on the lookout for that. But this week after service, let's all go to In-N-Out together and uh, be comforted by burgers. All right? Amen. Uh, okay, Wednesday, Recon. Please make some noise for Recon. Ooh. Okay, but there's no Recon this week. We will continue the week after March 1st. So uh, that'll be on pause this week. I love the excitement. Let's bring it next week, all right? But instead, uh, this coming Friday, February 24th, we will have Praise and Prayer Night. <coughs> and we're calling it uh, Renew. And so we will have dinner at 6.30 here at Grace Chapel. And then service uh, or Praise and Prayer will start at 7. So uh, please don't be shy and come through and just contend with us. And uh, one more announcement on top of that is we have one hour of Bible reading uh, right before praise and prayer, so at 5.30 to 6.30. So if you want to um, take some time to, you know, like catch up on your Bible reading plan, if you're behind, uh, don't be shy and come out. It'll be at room two, 215, which is upstairs, right? It's upstairs. So, um, yeah, if you just want to take some time to, you know, prepare your hearts or um, just catch up however behind you are, no shame. Uh, uh, come through, and we'll be doing that together quietly. Um, and otherwise, that is it for me, and I'll pass the mic off to Pastor Daniel. All righty, college. Um, I just want to make a quick push for STEM 2023. So, yes, STEM it uh, stands for Sarang Team for Evangelism and Missions, and apps are due February 25th. So if you have a free summer and you're interested in going on a short-term mission trip, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that during your college years, you go at least once. You know, you'll be working forever once you graduate, but it will be very rare until you retire where you could just take one month off uh, to go on missions. And so I highly recommend you take advantage of this. So apps are due on the 25th at 11.59 p.m., but on that day... Uh, there is going to be a mandatory orientation at main campus room 112 from 1 p.m. to 2, okay? So if you're interested uh, but not exactly sure what's going on and you have a lot of questions, we want to set aside that hour for you to come. Show you, we'll show you some pictures, give you a presentation, and you could ask whatever questions.
question you want, okay? So please make sure to sign up. And just one more, if, uh, if you are seriously interested, you might want to know this. Uh, the first day of STEM training will begin Saturday, March 4th. Okay, so Saturday, March 4th, that's the week after the orientation. We're gonna get started right away. And so what you need to do is you need to start clearing out your Saturday mornings. So if you have work or whatever else, you need to uh, let your boss know because uh, our mission training will be on uh, most Saturday uh, mornings uh, from March 4th and onward. So uh, just please keep that in mind. And if you're interested, please sign up. And please sign up early. It will help us a lot because especially if you're not a recom leader, uh, we will most likely want to do like a quick interview with you and I'll assure that uh, we, could, uh, we could get through everybody very quickly. Okay, with, no, with that, um, if you have any questions, please talk to me after service. Uh, I will hand off the mic to Pastor Paul for our scripture reading. Okay, our scripture reading for today comes from Jonah, the book of Jonah. Just, uh, you know, find it somewhere a little in the latter half of the OT. But chapter 1, we'll be reading the whole chapter 1 and then a couple verses from chapter 2. So Jonah chapter 1. And if we could uh, stand together as a sign of reverence as we read God's word. Jonah chapter 1. And then a couple verses out of chapter 2. All right. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gotten down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Verse, or chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Verse 10. And the Lord spoke to the fish, fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. This is God's word. You may be seated. Good morning. 
Uh, to those of you who don't know me, my name is Daniel. I'm one of the pastors here at E-College, and I have the privilege of preaching God's word today. Let's pray, and let's get right into it. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. As you draw our hearts and attention to this familiar passage, uh, whether we're inside the church or out, Lord, I'm sure that uh, we've, we've heard the story before. And so, God, I ask for your supernatural grace to open up our hearts and ears to hear, Lord, what you have to say to us as if for the first time. I pray, Lord, that you will also draw out new insights from this passage where old familiar, old and familiar texts uh, will become new as we see your message clearly, perhaps for the first time. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, uh, Pastor Paul preached on evangelism as we're in a series on missions uh, for this month. And uh, kind of like Pete Paul mentioned, I know when you think of evangelism and missions, especially evangelism, that word is kind of like a dirty word. It could conjure a lot of bad memories and experiences, and I think rightfully so. There's a lot of rotten apples uh, in the Christian church where it's kind of ruined it for everybody. But if you think about what evangelism actually is, like the heart of it, it's not very controversial. Evangelism is simply Christians sharing what's most core and fundamental and precious to them with the world. That's not something that Christians do particularly that no one else does. No, everybody in that sense is an evangelist for what they believe is beautiful and true. You know, if I were to sit down with Elon Musk, he'll talk about rockets and Mars for sure. If I talk to Greta Thunberg, he or she would probably talk about saving the planet. And if you were to talk to a Christian who loves the Lord as the one, number one thing in their lives, naturally that conversation will somehow, in, at some point in their relationship, lead to evangelism. And that's why Penn Gillette, who is an atheist performer uh, from Penn and Teller, I don't know if you guys heard of it, but it's a magician show in Las Vegas, and he's an atheist, but he says this, he says, look, uh, when I, uh, he says, he's an atheist, but he says, you know, I respect evangelists even though I don't agree with them and I get annoyed at them sometimes. He says, quote, how much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that, end quote. He's saying, look, you Christians, you know, you say you believe in Jesus Christ and in eternal life, and if that's what you really actually believe as an atheist, I could respect you at the very least for kind of going out of your comfort zone to talk to me about it. I don't agree with it. I think it's ludicrous, but I could respect that because you did that out of love. And so evangelism is not a weird thing. It's something that the church of God is called to do, and that's why we're in this series today. And to do that, today we're going to look at the book of Jonah. And I know it's a familiar passage, uh, but both secular and Christian scholars alike agree that for a small little book in the Bible, it's only four chapters, Jonah packs quite a punch. It's kind of unfortunate that all we think about is a whale and it's like a children's tale. Uh, but when you look at the book, it's very sophisticated and it's the masterpiece. The narrative is minimalistic but rich. There's not a single superfluous detail in the story. Every verse, every word, it drives the narrative forward. And when you look at the book of Jonah, uh, there's a breadth and range of emotions. It's complex, it's full of irony, it's comedic, tragic, and convicting, sometimes all at the same time. And there are moments in this book when you just kind of read it for yourself. You're not sure whether you should laugh or cry. That's the book of Jonah for you. But what matters most is theologically, this book packs quite a punch. When you look at the Old Testament storyline, the book of Jonah does more than many other books in driving uh, the, the theology of missions and evangelism forward more than books much bigger than this, uh, uh, than this one over here. And that's why the theologian and commentator Alexander Desmond, he says that in this little book, we see the missionary concern of God whose love and mercy was not limited to the Jews. Through the book of Jonah, God not only rebukes those who would confine his saving grace to the Jewish people, but he also forcefully demonstrates his real interest in the salvation of ignorant, sinful pagans. The love of God is great. And it's not just for Israel. It's not just for the church. It's for the world. 
the book of Jonah shows us that. And so for today's message, I just have one simple point. It's this. God's mission cannot be stopped by the church's disobedience. God's mission cannot be stopped by your and my disobedience to the great commission that God has given to us. Because this is something that it's initiated by God, powered by God. This is something where the end result is already written out in the book of Revelation where the mission will succeed. So the mission of God will go on despite our disobedience. And I hope that that's an encouragement for us as we look into this. So I want to take this one point and explore it in two different perspectives. First, we're going to look at the evangelist, the reluctant evangelist who runs away. And then second, we're going to look at the mission, which indeed goes on despite all of Jonah's efforts not to do so. So first, let's look at the evangelist who runs away in verses 1, 2, and 3. Verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out to it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, who is Jonah? Now, if you kind of know the story, you know he doesn't obey God. But we have to keep in mind that Jonah in this time was the navy seal of all the prophets in Israel. He was prophesying during the reign of Jeroboam II, which is, who is one of the most wicked kings in Israel. He was prophesying in the northern kingdom, which was more wicked than the southern kingdom. And so he was working in a very hostile environment. And oftentimes he was standing up against the king and against the people single-handedly. He comes from the heritage of Elijah and Elisha. And so he was, and Jonah was a star prophet who obeyed God courageously and stood up against the people. And so if there was one person whom God could rely on, if there was one person who was God's man, it was Jonah. And God gives Jonah, his prophet, a command. And this is the word. He says, arise, Jonah. Arise, go up. Arise and go to Nineveh and preach the gospel to it. But in the very next, next verse, we see a direct parody of God's command where God told Jonah to arise but in, but he, uh, arise towards Nineveh. But in verse 2, it says, and Jonah arose and went to Tarshish. Tarshish was literally the opposite direction of Assyria. Assyria was actually going a little, a little bit more north and eastward. Tarshish is literally in the Strait of Gibraltar, uh, which is all uh, as w- as westward as you could go. And so Jonah is booking it completely in the opposite direction. And when you look at verse 3, it says, and he goes down to Joppa and finds his ship, and then he goes down into it. And at the end of the narrative, he ends up down in the ocean below the sea level. And so when you look at verses 3, 3, and 10, we have no doubt that when Jonah is going, uh, is running away from God, this is a downward spiral. God tells Jonah to go up, but the narrator is saying Jonah is going down, down, and down, and repeating three times away from the presence of the Lord. Now, why does this matter for us today? I want to ask you, where are you with God today? Where are you in your relationship with God? Are you running away from God? Jonah had a pretty good record with God. Jonah was a star prophet, but in one day, it, but, but when this command came, he booked it. He ran away from God. And so the question for us today is not, where were you with God a month before? Where were you with God a year before? I'm not asking what your history with God has been like. Today, are you right with God or are you running away from him? You can run away quite literally <laughs> uh, uh, as Jonah had. Jonah ran away from Israel. He ran away from the covenant people, the church, and away from the preaching of the word as a way of trying to escape God, which was very futile, but that's what Jonah did. And maybe for us here today, maybe you might be running away from God, running away from church, from God's word. Or at the very least, in, your, in the depths of your heart, you want to run away from God. Maybe that's you. But you don't have to be outside the church to run away. You could run away while you're here. You could run away in the way that Jonah had, which is, You obey God up to the point where it makes sense to you. And as soon as he gives you a command that you don't agree with, that you don't like, you book it to the other direction. That's how we can often run away from God. And we live 
in a, di- uh, in a place where we delude ourselves because we think we're being obedient to God because 80% of the time we are obeying him. But when it comes to those things where we just don't want to, we say no. You know, Kara learned how to say yes and no, my daughter. And she just says it very bluntly. She only says yes to things that she likes. Kara, do you want to go to the playground? Yes. You want to eat yogurt? Yes. Do you want to take a bath? No. Do you want to eat your greens? No. Eat your greens. No. I think in our relationship with God, it could reach that level of childishness if we're honest with ourselves. Where you could be going out to church, doing all the right things, but you've kind of drawn a line for God and said, God, you could never cross this line. And we could be in the church for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and not know we're running away from God. What is that line for you? Well, for Jonah, that line, that line was the command to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel there. Like I said, the book of Jonah packs quite a punch theologically in driving the narrative of the Bible forward. And the reason is because in the book of Jonah, it's for the first time in recorded history, God sends an Israelite prophet to a non-Israelite nation to repent and turn to him. Now, uh, although it happens for the first time here, that was always God's intention. In Genesis 12, we see that God blesses Abraham, who's the father of Israel, so that he could be a blessing to the nation. So God's blessing of Israel was always cosmic and global in scope. It was never just for the church. It was for the church to be an agent of God's love and blessing for the world. And when you look through the book of Psalms, everywhere we see that uh, a reminder, even in how God's instructing the people how to pray, a reminder that their blessing is for the sake of the world. We look at Psalm 67, verses 1 and 2. God said, God instructs the people to pray this way. He says, may God be gracious to us and may God bless us and may God make his face shine upon us so that your ways may be known on the earth and your salvation among all the nations. This was always God's design as you're growing up in, as an Israelite and it's no different for us today as God has given us as a church the Great Commission. What enrages Jonah though was God's calling to go to Nineveh. You know what Nineveh was? Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, and scholars all agree Assyria, by modern standards, was what you could call a terrorist state. When I saw back, it's been a while now, but when ISIS was in full force, and what's interesting is they were actually uh, taking over some of the land that would have been ancient Nineveh and some of their brutal practices of not just killing their defeated enemies, but killing them grotesquely, uh, 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 defiling their bodies, hacking off body parts, all as a way to threaten and to poke fun. That's exactly what the Assyrians did. And it was very personal for Jonah because Jonah and the Israelites were subdued by the Assyrians. They were Israel's enemies. And at this point, they were paying tribute to the Assyrians And in this time, when Jonah was written, Assyria, which, you know, it was the big bully in town, and for the first time in recorded history, Assyria's power is waning. And this was the time for Israel to fight back and punish the heck out of them. But God says, Jonah, go. Go, call them to repent. Call them to turn to me. And Jonah's saying, no way, Jose. That's not what I signed up for. That's not what I want to see. And to put it crassly, Jonah wanted to see his enemies burn in hell. That's, that was a line for Jonah where he's refusing, absolutely just refusing uh, to be God's blessing to this world. And we see this failure of Jonah uh, continuing in verses 4 to 16. When you look at verses 4 to 16, we see Jonah interacting with his pagan world. And what's funny is we see that time and time again, the star prophet who's supposed to preach God's word and represent God's uh, love and ambassadorship, he fails to bear witness to it. He's, if you compare it with the pagans, he's more wicked than the people he's supposed to share the gospel to. And so look with me to verses 4, 4 to 16. In verse 4, we see the narrative speeds through very quickly. Jonah gets into the boat, 
and he gets into the sea, and sure enough, the storm comes. And we see Jonah interacting with the non-believer world, uh, non-believing world for the first time. And the irony here begins in verse 5. So the storm is coming and the pagans are diligently at work. They're crying out to their God and they're diligently at work trying to save the ship. But what does Jonah do? Look with me to verse 5. It says, so the mariners were afraid and each cried out to their God and they curled the cargo. But Jonah had gone down. Once again, he goes down into the innermost part of the ship. And once again, he laid down and he was fast asleep. Jonah's spiraling spiritually. This is not the sleep of faith where when Jesus was in the boat of a storm with his disciples, Jesus was sleeping soundly because he trusted God. But that's not what's going on here. Here, Jonah is trying to escape from his problems. He knows this storm is because of him. He doesn't want to face the reality of that. Isn't it so funny also how Jonah is supposed to be a blessing to them, but Jonah's presence is a curse to them as the storm is there because of Jonah's sinfulness. Jonah fails in many different levels to represent God properly. Now, but that's not, uh, that, that's just setting it up because we see the low point, the center of his foolishness and failure Later in verses 9 and 10. Uh, Yes, 9 and 10. So uh, when you look at verse 9, the the captain comes. It's so funny. Jonah goes down and down and down to sleep. The pagan captain comes, can't hear what's going on, and he knocks on the door, and he tells Jonah, Jonah, arise, get up. Same word that God told Jonah. Arise, wake up from your spiritual slumber, call out to your God so that we might be saved. It's so funny. God's commission is coming out of a pagan's mouth. And when you uh, look into this passage in verse 9 and 10, Jonah is now up. Presumably, he hasn't been crying out to God because he knows what's going to happen. <laughs> he knows that the storm is there because of him, and it's going to get really awkward. So they cast lots to see whose fault it is. And providentially, the lot falls on Jonah. And so the people, so Jonah's sins are exposed, and Jonah has to fess up in verse 9. And so the people ask him, Jonah, who are you? Who are you? Like, you know, where did you come from? Where is your country? And then in verse 9, he says, I am a Hebrew, look at this, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. I know I'm not that funny, but this is supposed to be that. This is supposed to be funny. When you read the narrative, you look at Jonah and you read this, you scratch your head, you're like, Jonah, everything you've done up until this point shows that you haven't been fearing God. And it's so funny that here, Jonah, you, you could almost see the pride as he says it. I'm a Hebrew, unlike you guys, and I fear God, unlike you. But the irony is, clearly Jonah is not fearing God, but who's the one who actually fears the Lord? It's the people who hear this, the pagans who hear this. It says in verse 10, and the men were exceedingly afraid. So Jonah says, hey, I fear God. I worship the God who made the heavens and the earth, the dry land and the seas, and I'm running away from him, by the way. And the people hear this, and they just can't believe what Jonah is doing. Jonah, you're telling me, that your God is the God of the seas, and you're running away? What are you doing, man? We are screwed. Like, they start to realize that this storm is not a natural storm, but a divine storm. And so they, they start to freak out as they comprehend who this God is. And so once again, Jonah here uh, is de- depicted as someone who doesn't fear God compared to the people who just heard about him, who's responding perhaps a little bit more righteously than Jonah should. And so to conclude... Jonah here in this story, he's a total hypocrite. He's a Christian, but he's all talk, no walk. Just do as I say, not as I do. He's a prophet who claims to fear God, but through his hypocrisy, he fails in every level to bear witness to God. What's the simple takeaway here for us, friends? Well, on one level, don't be like Jonah. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't say you believe God and fail to live like it. Don't be a Jonah. 
you know, but, uh, you know, uh, when you look into the Ten Commandments, one of the, the third commandment is, you shall not bear the name of the Lord your God in vain. And I think as Christians, we can kind of reduce that to just not using God's name as a swear word. But what that commandment is actually getting at is, yes, that's, that's part of it. But what the commandment is saying is, look, you bear God's name. God's name is written on you. You are God's representative on this world. Live according to it. You represent God. Live righteously. Live with dignity. Live in a way that honors God. Do not carry my name in vain. That's what that commandment means. And what that means, friends, for you and me is that we, like Jonah, don't get to choose to bear witness or not. The reality is, is that we're always bearing witness about what kind of God that we serve. You know, when Jonah said, I fear God, God is great, and that's why I'm disobeying him, by the way. <laughs> the people look, and they're like, Jonah, what, what is wrong with you? God must be a chump because he's okay with his servants being disobedient. You know, and for us, too, as we kind of go about our daily lives, what kind of witness are you bearing before God? As you go to your work, as you go to your school, as you get into group projects, or even as you are just a random customer at Starbucks for an hour or two, what would the people around you say about you? Because what they will say about you is what they will say about your God. Are you bearing witness to God? Do your roommates have good things to say about you? Do your coworkers have good things to say about you? Maybe if the only people that have good and high things to say about you are people in the church, there's a problem. We're not bearing witness for Jesus Christ like Jonah. We're being hypocrites. We're not bearing God's name. The reality is that we ought to be like Jonah. We ought not to be like Jonah. But we are like Jonah. When Jonah runs away from God and fails to bear witness, that's often our story as the church. And the good news is that although Jonah is unfaithful to God, we see in the story God is faithful to him. Jonah failed to bear the name of the Lord his God in a reverent manner before the unbelieving world. But Jesus Christ bore Jonah's name and ours with great pride and joy as he entered into the Holy of Holies in the presence of God our Father. When you look into uh, the uh, Exodus and Leviticus, when God gives his instructions to the priests, he tells the high priest to wear a, a, a robe and to wear 12 jewels upon his breastplate and to have the names of the tribes of Israel engraved and to enter the Holy of Holies so that the people's names would be in remembrance of the Lord. And that's what Jesus does for us every single day. He has, his he has our name written on his heart, and he goes to the presence of God faithfully, day in and day out, even right now, pleading for us, interceding for us, faithfully representing us before God our Father. And when we remember that, we will begin to bear, the wit bear God's name, which is a far greater privilege for us uh, before this unbelieving world. And so, number one, uh, we see an evangelist who's reluctant, and yet, um, uh, yes, so, so first point, we see an evangelist who is reluctant, and as we think about Jonah's life, we are reminded of our call to be a witness to this world. That's the first point. Now, the second point, which is a lot shorter. So that's the deal with Jonah. What about for the mission? So number two, the mission which can't be stopped. One of the irony in this story is that despite Jonah's poor witness and disobedience to God's command, God's mission doesn't stop and keeps on advancing in full force. You know, you know God still uses Jonah despite his kicking and screaming, despite his effort to do to run against him to be a blessing to the nations. When you look at the narrative structure in chapter 1, we see that the narrator really wants to point to the transformation of the pagan sailors. When you look at verses 4 to 5, the sailors, when 
uh, the pagan sailors, when the storm comes, it says that they worship their own gods. But then in verse 16, after witnessing God's deliverance, the men, these pagan sailors, they feared the Lord, and they offered sacrifices and made vows to God. And a Bible commentator, Daniel Timmer, he said that there's virtually no doubt that these formerly polytheistic sailors became faithful worshipers of God. And when you look at these two actions of making a vow and offering a sacrifice, it's the same action that Jonah himself says he will do when he actually turns around in chapter 2, verse 9. And so we see that through Jonah's interaction with these pagan sailors, God's mission still somehow advanced. And that's good news for us, friends, because when we look at ourselves, when you look at your own life, and as I look at mine, we often find ourselves failing. But the hopeful implication is that God's mission is bigger than our ability to carry it out because it's based on God's will and God's capacity to find his plan fulfilled. In, his, in the final analysis, God will be successful. His mission will go on. And Jonah, regardless of what he wanted, he wasn't the center of God's plan for missions. He couldn't choose whether to participate or not. The only thing he could choose is whether to be a willing participant or an unwilling participant. Now, that's true for you and me today. Why does this matter? You too, like Jonah, can't choose to participate. It's a matter of being a willing or an unwilling participant. Let me give you, uh, if I could uh, explain this a little bit. One of the greatest scholars when it comes to missions and evangelism, uh, he's from Fuller Seminary. His name is Ralph Winter. He studied how Christianity spread throughout the globe in the past 2,000 years. And one of the surprising findings that uh, he got was that missions and evangelism doesn't happen in the way that most people imagine. When you think of missions and evangelism, we think of people faithfully obeying God and launching out and spreading, go spreading the gospel intentionally, kind of like how Paul did it, and kind of like how maybe we might through STEM. But Ralph Winter concluded, actually, most missions happens involuntarily. The church is not really trying to do it, but somehow, through God's providence, the church finds itself in the center of God's plan for missions. And this happens in two ways. Number one, through involuntary scattering. You know, when you look at the Christians in the Roman Empire, they experienced persecution. And one of the ways that they involuntarily became evangelists was when the Christians who were persecuted were sold as slaves into the Gothic barbarians in Europe. And as these Christians were spread, up, were spread far beyond to the ends of the earth in Europe, the Christian slaves, they shared the gospel to their European captors, and that's how large parts of Germany and France became Christianized. Other times, when God doesn't scatter Christians out into this world, God brings the world to the Christians' doorsteps. For instance, when you look into the Dark Ages, when the Christians in Europe failed to take the gospel out to the world, Christian Europe was invaded by Vikings from Scandinavia, and they invaded many parts of Christianized Europe. And as these, w w as these Vikings came in contact with their Christian victims, these Vikings got to see and experience the gospel of forgiveness. And they were converted themselves, and they took the gospel back to Scandinavia. So when you look at missions, God is always working in this world to bring us into contact with people who don't know him. And I want to ask you, as we look into this book of Jonah, how is, that, how is that happening in your life right now? Have you been involuntarily sent out? You got into a four-year university far away uh, or didn't get into a four-year university, and you ended up at this, uh, this uh, uh, a junior college where you, know, you wanted to go to a Christian university, but here you are. I don't know what the situation is. Where, but we can often think that, you know, there are accidents that happen, but in God's plan, these are ways that God involuntarily sends us out to face a world that doesn't know God. Or what about, um, so, so as you think about your place in the university or in the workplace, this is God's way 
of moving you into missions, whether you sign up for STEM or not. And so the only question for us today, friends, is not just are we going to sign up for STEM or not, but are you going to be obedient as a willing participant in God's mission? Because whether you sign up for STEM or not, you are in God's mission, as Jonah was. And that's where I want to conclude. Are you being obedient to this call for God, to this call from God for you to be a witness? Or have you been running away? Have you been like Jonah, where you've been trying to run away, but God is still bringing you in contact to the non-believing world? His call and commission for you is to go and be a light, to share your faith, to live righteously and justly, bearing God's name, not in vain, but with honor and integrity so that people can see the light of Jesus Christ. You know, the good news is that when you think about Jonah, um, Jonah, as he jumped into the sea, he died. Uh, or, or he should have died. <laughs> jo Jonah went into the sea. He should have died. And Jonah, as he said to the pagan sailors, pick me up, throw me out. The storm is here because of God's displeasure over my life. Just throw me out and you'll be saved. You know, in a, in a way, that's a strange picture uh, of what Jesus Christ did for us. Because when you look at Jonah as he jumped off into the sea uh, to save the ship, that's what Jesus Christ has done for us. When you look at Jonah, Jonah jumped off the sea, but he got to live. And the only reason is because there was a greater Jonah in Jesus Christ where Jesus jumped off the ship for us, for Jonah, so that Jonah too can be saved. And so this story is not just about the ship and the sailors being saved and coming to know who God is, but this story is also about God's mercy for Jonah as God saved him because there was a greater Jonah who took his sin, his failure to witness him properly on the cross to die so that he can live a day again for his glory, and that's the message for us too. As we've been unfaithful, as we haven't been bearing witness, because Jesus Christ died for us, he was drowned for us, we can live and bear witness one more day. That's your call. That's the God, that's the gift of God for you, for me. And so with that, I want to uh, take this time to close with a response song. Uh, but before we do, I just want to take this moment uh, to respond in prayer. I want to ask, as we're in this mission series, what are some ways where you, like Jonah, have been sent out, knowingly or unknowingly, into a boat to interact with non-believers? And when you reflect back, your conduct hasn't been the best. You've been a hypocrite. You haven't borne witness. People have a bad idea of God and Christianity. He's just a, a chump, just, just a guy that people believe and doesn't transform their lives. Has that, has that been your story, the way that you've been witnessing to the, the beauty of Jesus Christ? As we drown in this sin of failing to witness, we don't need to drown because Jesus drowned for that. Can we come and confess our sin and give thanks to God for his mercy over your life, first and foremost, for having mercy on you when you run away from his call, from his commission to be the light. So let's just come and uh, confess our sin and give thanks to the mercy that's over our lives.
Father, we just want to thank you for your mercy for us. When we fail to bear witness to you, when we lived as hypocrites, not only before your eyes, but before the eyes of the world, when you've called us to stand and bear your name with honor and to reflect your image, Lord, we fail that call deliberately, rebelliously, living our self-centered ways, living as if life was about us and we've tarnished your name. Lord, we don't have to look to people like Donald Trump or televangelists. We just need to look at our own lives to see that we fail to bear witness to God. We've, brought, we've given reproach to your name. And Lord, we confess that and we thank you for your mercy, which is for us, where you've died first and foremost for us when we've oftentimes acted more unrighteously than the world that's before us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We pray, Lord, that as we receive this forgiveness, that from this day forward, that we would truly carry your name with honor as we're humbled by your cross, as we're humbled by what you've done for us. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you rise from your seats? Let's respond with uh, this song, Mercy is More. Stand in the dead we could never afford. 
Father, we thank you that we are still gathered here by your mercy, that despite our failure, you recommission us, you forgive us, and you send us out one more time with a second chance as you gave Jonah. I pray, Lord, that your mercy will reverberate in our hearts as we go out, as you send us out. And I pray also, Lord, for those that you are putting in their hearts to go on summer missions this year. I pray, Lord, uh, that you would call us to go willingly, perhaps this summer, to go out into the nations, to share your gospel, to be your salt and light. Lord, will you come and work in our hearts. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, God bless you, e-college. Uh, yes, just a reminder, if you are free for lunch today, we are going to have a luncheon at In-N-Out on Firestone in La Mirada. Please join us there. If you do have some time in between, uh, especially if you're not a newcomer, we do need some help with the chairs. We do have to put it away before we go. Uh, so maybe in about five minutes or so, let's start cleaning that up. Thank you so much.